Hi everybody, welcome to today's online learning session. Today we're talking about how to support a participant to get the supports that they need. Just a bit of housekeeping before we start the session today. We'd love for you to participate in our polls so that we can learn more about you. So you can find the polls tab at the bottom of, uh, sorry, at the top of this window. If you can't see the polls tab, you can follow the on-screen instructions. So click on more in the top bar of this window, select add an app and choose polls from the apps. For any questions you have today, feel free to use the Q&A tab at the top of the screen. We'll have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of today's webinar and we'll go through all your questions there. Today's session is being recorded and we will share this recording post event with everybody. Sorry, Caitlin, can I just ask if you launched the poll? Yep, just launching the poll now. Okay. I'll give you a few minutes to go through those polls and answer them. Today's first speaker is the Head of Business Excellence, Home and Community at Endeavour Foundation. I'd like to pass it over to her in the meantime. Thanks, Nicola. Um, doesn't look like Nicola's with us. <laughs> That's okay. She's having some issues with connectivity. In the meantime, we'll give you some time just to answer those polls. And it looks like a majority of people coming through are support coordinators. We have a few specialist support coordinators and a few managers among us and a few other. Okay. Okay. I think I've fixed okay, the issues. Okay, So we've got I'm not going to touch now. We'll anything. Just get on screen. It's okay. Welcome, Nicola. Thanks, Caitlin. I'm going to the next slide, Caitlin. Okay. Hey, Nicola, are you still with us or are you frozen? I am with you, but I can't okay. see anything. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, you can okay just perfect. You keep going. Do you want me to kick off? Sorry, yep. I can't see anything yes. that's happening, but that's okay. Things are <laughs> working. Well, we'll roll with it. So thank you very much, Caitlin, for the introduction. And it's lovely to see so many people joining us for what is our second webinar today um, in part of our support coordinator uh, series. I thought it would be a wonderful opportunity to, to take today to share with you some of the work that Endeavour Foundation uh, currently does when it comes to plan reviews to support our clients through this process and to work very closely with their network, including support coordinators like yourselves to make sure that we make the most out of this process and get the best outcome for our clients. So. For those of you who may not be familiar with Endeavour Foundation, Endeavour Foundation has been around for more than 70 years. We support approximately 3,700 people with disabilities um, in Queensland and communities right throughout Queensland and into New South Wales and Victoria. 
And so what this means is that in recent years, we have had many opportunities to work at how we can best support our clients through the plan review process. Uh, more recently, we have also kickstarted a major initiative to look at all of our clients who live in our supported independent living homes and to review all of their support needs and make sure that that aligns really closely with their NDIS goals and their funding. So this is an initiative that Endeavour is, is really serious about and it's about us making sure we are really proactive, that we are looking for continuous improvement opportunities um, and that we're keeping client safety and wellbeing at the forefront of everything that we do. Um, and what it meant is that through this process, we have collected a whole lot of evidence that we've been able to bring to the plan review process for clients if they have a plan review that's uh, upcoming in the, the near future. Or sometimes it's led to us um, working with clients to see if they would like to instigate a change of situation uh, application. So. I am aware that there might be some people on the, the call today who may have already had some conversations with Endeavour uh, in this regard. Um, but look, really what I wanted to do this morning is to take the opportunity to share with you a recent example of where Endeavour Foundation has been really successful in working very closely with one of our support coordinators uh, to achieve a really positive outcome for one of our clients who's living in one of our still properties. And for um, all purposes today, I'm going to refer to that client as Charlie. So for Charlie, uh, this process kicked off 90 days before the end of the expiry of his plan, which is the usual process here in Endeavour. Um, and we allocated a specialist disability practitioner to have a look into all of our internal documentation around Charlie and also to review the latest medical reports that we had on file. And through that process, what we identified was that Charlie had had um, some decline in his functional capacity and really his support needs were no longer aligning with what we needed to be providing for, for Charlie. So that instigated an internal meeting first off where the disability specialist practitioner met with the team on the ground who supports Charlie in, in our homes uh, to talk about what are some of those opportunities. But really early on, we also reached out to Charlie's client nominee and also uh, to the support coordinator to share some of the observations that we'd noted and to find out more about how we could work together through this process. Uh, and that in that we agreed that Endeavour Foundation would collate a whole lot of evidence that we had available from um, risk reports through to case notes and medical reports. Uh, and that we would also develop quite a detailed support letter that could be incorporated as part of the review process. Uh, now, because we were speaking to um, Charlie's nominee, which was his mum in this circumstance, we also were able to include some of the observations that um, mum had seen as well as part of that support letter. The really great news with this story is that together with the support coordinator, Charlie was able to achieve a $70,000 increase in his SIL funding. Now, what that looks like for Charlie is that he, we were able to change the home roster from him receiving one as to eight support to one as to four supports, which essentially has allowed our team to provide a lot more support around his emotional regulation. And we are now starting to see Charlie building some really lovely friendships within the home as a result of that support. Um, Charlie's also really interested in mechanics. That's one of his big hobbies. And with the additional support, our team has been able to assist him in building a truck from an old um, golf buggy. So that's really made a difference to Charlie and his life. And we've been really proud of being able to work uh, alongside a very proactive support coordinator to um, be able to achieve that for this client. Um, now, look, this is just one of many examples I could share that we are currently working with support coordinators on. And 
How we work really depends on the individual support coordinator, the process that we're going through. Um, but the one thing that we are observing is that we get the best outcomes when we work really closely and in collaboration with that support coordinator and with the client. Uh, so I, I thank you for the opportunity of being able to share that example with you. Um, I'm really looking forward to this session uh, to hear Mary talk through some advice around plan reviews and, and like you to continue to learn about best practice. Before we kick off though, I have been asked to remind everyone that today we do have a lucky door prize uh, that Support Coordinator Academy have uh, donated. It's an excellent prize. It is a free coaching session um, with one of the, the teams. So. I would encourage everyone on the line to, to hang on for the full duration of this session, not just to learn some excellent professional development tips, but also to see if you might be our lucky door prize winner at the end. So on that note, Mary, I'm going to hand over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Nicola. I really, really appreciate it. Okay, guys, let's get started. So I need to... Okay, all sorted. Right. Okay, so I'm here today on behalf of Endeavour just to really talk to you a little bit about pre-planning. We're going to look at the NDIS review, participant plan reviews. So I'm really going to focus on how you set, your, set yourself up with some really good best practice processes and systems to make that review process more efficient and actually more supportive for participants to really help them understand what's been achieved over the period and life of their plan. So it's really about setting up that structure right at the beginning so that when you get to that review process, it's a lot more streamlined. Okay, so just before we start, I'd first like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today and pay my respects to the elders past and present and emerging. And I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today. So I'm, I'm running this session from Turrbal and Yagara country in Queensland. Brisbane. So let's make a start. The other thing I just want to note before we make start is that throughout this session I'll refer to the general term as a participant. So just want to let you know that when I say this I'm also referring to anyone who might be in that person's or acting on that person's behalf. So it could be the participant themselves, it could be their nominee, their carer, their parent. So just letting you know that up front. Okay so let's get started. Okay so when we talk about the NDIS review process for participants, the aim of the NDIS review is to assess how a participant has progressed towards achieving their goals and to really gather evidence of a participant's future support needs. So we're going to explore planning and how this process will help you to streamline your NDIS reporting, but also to support a participant to be able to understand and review their progress. So as a support coordinator, it's really, really important that when you first start working with a participant, that you start to set a bit of a baseline. So you're gathering information around that person's context at that point in time. This will really help you to measure their progress over the period of their plan. OK, so there's some minimum information that we gather or that in, as part of our NDA support coordinator training that we teach people to gather as part of this planning process. So, okay, so the first one that I'm going to talk to you about is um, understanding the impact on the person's daily life. So this means understanding how the person's disability impacts on their ability to do those daily tasks. So they're things like personal care, accessing the community, expressing their needs, having a voice, all of those things that we take for granted on a daily basis. Understanding the functional impact will also help you to understand their disability related needs and it starts to help you to indicate what types of supports will be needed. And this, so the, when you start to gather this information and you're looking at the NDIS plan, it all starts to tie together and make sense. Okay, so what I suggest that people do is really focus on the NDIS. So the NDIS uses six domains of substantially reduced functional capacity to measure how a person's disability impacts on their daily life. So referring back to these six domains will help you to use that consistent language that the NDIS use 
but it'll also make a lot of sense to the person that you're providing this reporting to. Okay, so I'll give you an example. So say you're working with someone who has suffered a stroke, and as a result of their stroke, they've got access to the NDIS. So as their support coordinator, you've got access to a functional capacity assessment from an OT that states the impact for the person is a limited capacity to articulate their needs around their inability to clearly communicate. Um, but also they might be partially paralysed down their left hand side, so they need a wheelchair for mobility. They'll need support workers to provide personal care to help, you know, personal care around showering, also to have domestic support to access the community. So understanding that significant function, reduced functional capacity really helps you to bring it back to why they came into the NDIS in the first place, but it also helps you to start using the NDIS language quite consistently. So during the planning process, when you first meet with a participant, you would start to really look at the evidence that you've already got. So are there any reports? You know, you're talking to family, you're talking to friends, you're talking to other service providers, but more specifically to that really informal network. And you're starting to gather more in-depth information, but also understanding about how the person's disability impacts on their daily life. Because what a report will say and what the person says or what people are observing could be two different things. So it's always good to gather that information. Okay. So the other part of the information that you will need to gather is around a person support network. Because this often impacts on their ability to access supports. And again, starts you to help to identify what are those gaps in supports. So these would all include things like their informal support, so people and connections who are important to that person. So this includes where they live, their family, their friends, people who are related to their culture or religion. So it generally relates to any person or thing like a cultural religion that they, that they go to regularly, but also who they trust and who are really, really close to them. Also supports that they're accessing in the community. So this is about understanding how the person participates in their broader community or like, do they feel included or are they isolated? Who they interact with regularly or do they not interact with people at all? So it really starts to unpack and understand this person around what they're passionate about, what they would like to do or what opportunities would they like to explore. Also mainstream support. So who are they already connected with? And by understanding all this other information, you're really starting to see what other mainstream services like health, mental health, aged care, um, justice, lots and lots, you know, um, G local GPs or specialists or whatever that might be. You're really starting to understand what are some of those connections that you can link them into. And then we get to NDIS funded support. So these are already, you might be working with a person who's already had a plan and they might already have supports in place, or this might be their first plan. But it's about taking the time to go, who are you, what supports you're already accessing and are they still working? And do we need to review them to make sure that they're still meeting their needs? Okay. And then one of the other things that's really important to gather, and remember, these are just three of the parts of the information that we suggest that you gather if you're going to gather minimum information. So this is about taking the time to really unpack and explore someone's goals. This is about understanding just because there's goals on a participant's plan, it's really bringing it back to the person-centred planning and really saying to the person in their network, but what do these goals actually mean to you? So when I say this, what does that actually mean to you? And what supports are already in place? What needs to change or happen to achieve these goals? And really talking to someone about, so if this goal, if you were able to achieve your goal, what would be, what would be the outcome? What would, be the, what would that look like? for you. So it's really getting their perspective and not making assumptions about what those goals mean. This really helps you to break the goals down, but what it also does is it really helps to identify other goals that the person might have, which is fine. Really helps you to do that person-centered planning and you start to really get to know this person. So it's really important to have a structured process in place to gather this information. So that you get consistency, especially if you're in a team, everybody's using the same process. 
So in our NDIS support coordinator training, we use what's called a plan unpacking guide. So that's a tool that we introduce to step support coordinators through like a guided process. And it also helps a participant to unpack and understand that plan. So really look at it from a person-centered, strengths-based, and in a holistic focus. So you really start to understand who that person is and start to set a baseline of their current situation. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Remember to go to the Q&A section up the top and write down all your questions because we're gonna have time at the end to answer all your questions. Okay, I'm gonna keep talking. Okay, here we go. Right. Go and have a look at the planning review process. So when I talk about a planning review process, I'm not talking about the NDIS planning review process. I'm talking about a support coordinator's planning review process. Okay, this is part of the pathway that support coordinators go, go through when they're working with participants. So when we look at reviewing a participant's progress, generally we start to go through a bit of a review process once the participant's been linked into these supports and we constantly go through that monitoring, coaching, refining and review process. One thing that support coordinators will also be doing or should be doing is regularly checking in, having scheduled check-ins, so like at least once a month, checking in whether it's a phone call, whether it's an email or setting up regular times to go and meet just to say, hey, how are things going? What's happening? Because we all know that we work with participants who contact us all the time, and so they schedule regular check-ins as necessary. But we also work with participants who, who kind of stand back and we don't get to hear from them all the time. So no matter what your caseload's in, scheduling in at least once a mind to touch base and check in to make sure things are okay. So the other part of the scheduled check-ins is it really helps you, so not only just checking in with the participant, but also checking in with the service providers. So this really helps you to build that collaborative working relationship with the extended participant network. What it also does is if you build that relationship and take the time to build that collaborative working relationship, providers, no matter who they are, are more likely to contact you, especially in the situation as what Nicola was talking about, when, when a person's situation changes or something happens. So, and also in highly complex situations. So if you've got a, a, a real high complex situation, often there's a little bit of, it could be some risks involved, or you might have multiple stakeholders involved and they could be mainstream, they could be community, they could be funded, could be a whole new uh, cultural or family network. Setting up regular care review meetings so that everybody comes together and we all start to work together in a collaborative way. So it's about, setting up that network of supports around a person to develop that resilience. So the aim of the key review meetings are to share updates, to really go what's working, what's not working, start to identify barriers and any risk, and also agreeing on actions that each person or provider will take responsibility for. So this is about saying, I'm not gonna be holding all the risk, that's not my responsibility. So what is your role? What is your role? What is your role? And what actions are you gonna to take to take some of that responsibility about managing that risk for that person? So we start to set up that resilient network. Okay. Let's have a look at scheduled NDIS reviews. So we all know a scheduled review it used to be called a scheduled review. Now it's called like a reassessment. So the name keeps changing. But these often happen within the last 90 days or the last three months of a person's plan. However, we all know that the length of a person's plan could be three months or six months if they have really unstable supports or it's a highly complex situation. Or they could go for three years if the supports are more stable. So... When we focus on best practice and you're talking about that, that regular check-ins, um, that regular contact with participants, it's also about doing the, a review process at a minimum once a year. So you might not be required to do NDIS reporting every year, especially if they have a three-year plan, but it's about going through this process so after a year to come back and review how the participants progressing, are the goals still the same? Are things still working? What's working? What's not working? But it's about 
taking that time to set another baseline. So you've got your previous baseline, now you've got your new baseline. So what's changed? What's been achieved? What's working? What's not working? And then you set another baseline at that point in time. And what, what a baseline around a person's situation does is it gives you a really clear picture of that person's situation. So if something changes, you've automatically got that information to go, well, this was the previous situation and now we're at this point in time. And this is what changed and this is the impact. So when you're reporting to the NDIS, that becomes a lot clearer. Okay. The other part of a plan review process is, of course, meeting with a participant. So that's about reviewing how how they feel about their goals? Are the goals stay the same? How do they feel about achieving their goals? So really starting to focus on what outcomes have been achieved and are they the outcomes that the person want to achieve? So whether their supports are continuing to meet their needs, have the supports changed or is anything significantly changed and they need to change again? Or are there any gaps in their support needs? So it's about, again, reviewing that baseline and also looking at the previous information that you've gathered to reflect on what's changed over that point in time. Okay, hopefully I'm making sense, but again, happy to answer questions. Okay, I'm just going to keep going because I'm mindful of the time and I'd like to have as much time as possible to answer questions. Okay, so the next thing we're going to start looking at is NDIS reporting. So the most important part of the support coordinator's job is to evidence the support needs. So it's not as easy as saying, well, I work with a participant, I've talked to providers, this is what they need. It's about evidencing the reduced and significant functional impact of that person's disability. So what is it? How does that impact on that person? And gathering evidence to support the recommendations that you're making. Okay. Another point I want to make is that when you start to go through wanting to gather reports or gather information, if you've already built that collaborative working relationship with that, with that participant's extended network, gathering this information becomes a lot easier because you've already built that network and that relationship. Okay, another really good point is that when you're supporting a participant to set up their service agreements, it's really important to include any requirements around reporting. So it could be even if you've got someone going into the home and then providing domestic support. So has how has that been a capacity building support? Has there been any skill development in that? Or it could be support workers. It could be a number of people. But thinking about when you're setting up service agreements, also talking to the participant about when we get to that review process, what kind of information do we want from the support network? to give us written evidence about what capacity has been built or what other outcomes have been achieved. And also, what have they noticed and what supports are required going, going into that next stage for that person. Okay, so let's have a look at some, this, 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 these are just a couple. There will be way more providers depending on the supports that the person's receiving. But these are the ones that I get asked about mostly. So let's look at therapy-based reports. Okay, so when you're asking for therapy-based reports, and you can write this into the service agreement about when and how and how often, so they need to provide information about the therapy approach. So is it, if it's speech therapy, what approach did they use? Are they providing, are they providing therapy support within the community? Um, you know, what, what were the goals that were trying to be achieved? providing evidence of any outcomes that have been achieved and including any progress towards achieving their goals. As well, the next step is then any recommendations around future therapy support needs. So is this therapy continued within the next plan or within the next year? Let's review what it looks like now and how is that going to change or is that going to continue within the next period? Um, and uh, the other one that I get a lot of questions around are occupational therapy, functional capacity assessments. So you will more than likely, everyone will know what this is, but it's a comprehensive report that analyzes a participant's ability and carrying out their daily activities. And it helps to ensure that the participant receives the right amount of support and funding to support them to be able to work towards and achieve their goals. 
So a question that I often get is, is it necessary to get a functional capacity, a full functional capacity assessment every year? And no, it's not. So if you've got a function, uh, because these functional capacity assessments will take anywhere between 10 to 12 hours to complete, which is a lot of funding that can come out of a participant's NDIS plan. So if the impact of a person's disability has not changed, then just an update to the functional capacity assessment. So here's the functional capacity assessment, asking the OT if they're still connected to that person, let's provide an update. So where is this person's situation at now? Has anything changed? Is there any different supports that you would recommend based on the impact of their disability? The other thing is too, is that, but however, if a participant's situation has changed significantly. So the person could have been living at home and now they're in supported accommodation, or um, there's a number of reasons why they might have a disability um, that could have deteriorated and they needed more support. So if you go through that whole process of a change in situation, which is the next webinar we will be talking about, then a new functional capacity assessment would be more appropriate. And that's around evidence the participants' future support needs due to the impact on that person's disability around that change in situation. So hopefully that makes things a bit clearer. Okay, um, other really valuable reports or information to gather are from support workers and cell providers. It's because support workers uh, interact with participants on a daily basis. So they'll have really valuable insight into a participant's capacity. It's important to request reports from support workers or the cell providers. And it's very much what um, Nicola was talking about earlier. So these could be as email as, as um, you know, on a, if, if, if you might be working with someone with really complex needs, so you'd have quite regular meetings. But it's also about when you're going through your review process at, at the end of the year, really to get something in writing that really talks about what is the support that you're providing? What outcomes were achieved? What capacity was being built? Have, have their support needs changed? So it's really instigating that review process, but not just for yourself and the, not for yourself as a support coordinator, but also for those providers. The amount of times that I've had providers come back to me and say, thank you, that's such a good prompt to actually come back, take the time to review this person's situation. Okay. And the other thing about NDIS reporting, so the evidence based is really about when you're filling in that NDIS report, what is the evidence to show what the the where's your, what information have you gathered to evidence the future support needs for that participant? Yeah. So it's coming back to that functional significant reduced functional capacity. Okay. Um, most of you will be aware of the new NDIS reporting templates which were introduced with PACE. So PACE is transitioning in. Um, here's a link if you can't find the templates, but they are built into, into PACE. But also if you're not if you're not working with participants that have PACE, you can actually use, download these, these templates and actually use them. It helps you to start to get that consistency in your reporting structure. So remember, these are for these templates for support coordinators and there's separate templates for psychosocial recovery coaches. So you will likely know that all support coordinators and all psychosocial recovery coaches will, will need to have access to PACE and they will all be using the same template. So this is great for the sector because it's starting to set up that consistency and framework for practice in the way that we do things. Okay, how are we going for time? Good, 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 good. Okay. This is the last slide and then we start to get to questions. Okay, so we are going to have a look at NDIS progress reporting. Um, so when, just before we start to go into the content, so when you're filling in the NDIS progress report template, so there's two templates. One template is implementation report, which is really about that eight-week check-in with the NDIS. Again, setting a bit of a baseline, this is where the person's at at this point in time. Um, and then you've got your progress report. So your progress reports are around they, as part of the NDIS request for service, will actually tell you how often these reports need to be filled in. But when you're filling in these reports, come back to that base of information that you first collected. 
What was that baseline? What has changed over that period of time? And come back to those six domains of substantially reduced functional capacity. I actually go communication. How does this impact on the person? What are the supports that have been put in place? And I actually clearly link back to the substantially reduced functional capacity because it's the language that the NDIS use and it clearly links back to the support needs. Okay. Again, using the NDIS language is really it's a really good habit to get into. So NDIS progress reporting. Okay. The, the first part of the report really talks about participant goals. So really using that baseline and, and gathering that information to go, so what were the person's goals? Uh, how did they progress toward achieving their goals? And what are the next steps? Have the goals changed? Are the goals the same? But also you start to identify, so the, the person, say for example, might have a goal around accessing the community, but they, were, they weren't able to really, they, they've got some minor progress around achieving their goals. And then you would really talk about, so what were the barriers for that person to actually access in the community? So it might be around that the person was in and out of hospital and they didn't really have the opportunity, or it might be in relation to lack of um, appropriate support being able to access. So it's really starting to tie the goals and barriers around accessing these supports and what that actually looks like. The next part really talks about celebrations. So really starting to share some of those participants' achievements. Um, for example, uh, been working with a gentleman who um, has an acquired brain injury and has a, real, a lot of issues around speech. And we were able to really show based on that baseline and what the person, the, the impact was right at the beginning to a year later, we were really been able to articulate. So these were the words that they were able to say. This is what they can do now. They have, you know, back in back in the beginning of the year, they didn't have a lot of confidence in actually articulating their needs in the community. Now they're able to have full conversations. So it's really showing and celebrating some of those achievements and outcomes achieved. Uh, community and mainstream support. So again, when you're gathering that baseline information, starting to link in, really identifying what are the current supports that the person's already accessing, but also looking to the future. What are some of the linking opportunities that you've already explored through that review process that you've done already done with the participant and that support network? Um, really starting to also highlight any barriers to accessing support. And what are some of the strategies that you're going to put in place? This really shows the NDIS how you are supporting a participant to think about the future, that you're exploring opportunities and you're really getting the person to think about opportunities as opposed to barriers. Okay, let's have a look at funded support. So again, it comes back to the core capacity building and capital, capital budgets, which is what the NDIs are using at this point in time. So really talking about what supports were put in place and how are these supports currently meeting the participant support needs? What's working well? And also it could be about what's not working well, but also about what are the future support needs? Are they the same? And if they're the same, then you talk about what's the same, uh, but what are the, how are the goals different or how will the approach be different? Or really talking about, say, for example, you could be working with someone who has an intellectual disability and they might be accessing some, some day programs around social skill development. So their, their goal might have been around building building really uh, really good relationships. And so as part of that year, that would be the skill development focus around building those really positive relationships. And now their goal is still to extend their, their friends and their, that, that social connection. So the goal might be the same, but the activities may be different. So the activities might be, well, now I actually want to go on social gatherings with those friends outside that program. So it's really thinking about might be the same goals, but the activities could be different. So focusing on what are the activities, because that really indicates level of supports and the kind of supports that are required. Okay, referrals, assessments and reports. This is where you include all the information that you've gathered to evidence a participant's future support needs. So it could be a um, an observations from families and friends or their informal networks. 
It could be, you know, uh, something from writing from the support workers that are working with that participant or the cell providers, therapy reports. This would the, the amount and the type of evidence that you require will depend on the, the network of that person. And again, it's coming around if you're recommending future supports, what evidence do you have that, that that's going to support that person to overcome these barriers? Okay, and then the last one that they're referring to is participant safety. So this is around managing risk. So it's about understanding if there are any risks. So there's a difference between barriers and risks. Risks are more urgent. Um, so risks are really about uh, what are there any risks? And what is the impact of that risk on the person? So if that if there is a level of risk involved, and if and what is the impact on that person? But also, what actions have you taken to mitigate that risk? So, what what pre planning have you done with that person? So, have you put strategies in place? You might be talking about care review meetings, how often you meet, who are the stakeholder group, um, and also if it's really high complexity, what I was talking about earlier, and if you are running care review meetings, but also if there's a high level of risk then linking back to your risk assessments and risk management plans. So when you're doing a risk management plan, it needs to be a collaborative approach. It's not just your risk management plan, it's the support network. It's about bringing together that collaborative approach for that whole support network and, and attaching that to the report, sending it into the NDIS. Okay. That's me. That's a lot of information <laughs> to observe, to absorb. So happy for some questions. Um, Caitlin, do you want to take the screen back? Yep, absolutely. Awesome. Okay, okay we'll so the first question that we have that's come through is from Kazu. And Kazu was asking, if the SIL situation hasn't changed, do we still need a SIL quote for the new plan period? Nicola, do you want to answer that? Sorry, your microphone's off. I'm actually not sure on requirement. I might need to get you to talk to that, Mary, but we do provide, I know as part of our preparation for plan reviews, we will always include um, a new proposal of this is what it looks like um, in our supports, but whether that is a requirement for every provider, I might need to defer to you, Mary. That's okay. So, okay, I'm just gonna see if I can see the question again. Okay. Can you just repeat that question, Caitlin, because I can't actually see them. Yep, it says, if the SIL situation hasn't changed, mm -hmm. do we still need a SIL quote for the new plan period? No. So so basically what the NDIS is saying is that if the, if the SIL arrangement is still meeting the person's needs, and again, going through this review process, setting that baseline, being able to measure progress, has anything changed, have support needs changed, that will clearly tell you if, if the funding is actually continuing to meet their needs. So if nothing's changed, then the same funding will roll over. But if there is a significant change like Nicola was actually talking about before, then it's really coming back to, so what's changed? What do the support needs look like now? Gathering that evidence, especially a functional capacity assessment to go, well, what is reduced functional capacity now? How does that impact on the person and what level of support is now required? Hopefully I'm answering the right question because that's my perception of what you've asked. Okay, um, Kat Moore just sent through a comment and she said, I can answer this. No, it isn't needed. If the arrangement hasn't changed, SIL funding will remain the same with CPI added. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, that's Kat. awesome. My answer was a bit longer. <laughs> Okay, next. Okay, the next one is from Kathleen, and Kathleen is asking, is there a specific form or template that a support worker can complete to provide a progress report of their own, as currently the service provider reports are done by plan partners, etc., not the actual support workers? Okay, so what you're saying is, is that the actual service provider is providing more of an overview around the Around the, the service provider reports are done by plan partners currently. So they're asking if there's a specific form or any template that a support worker can complete to provide a progress report of their own. Okay, so I actually developed my own 
report template and it's really, really basic. Um, and, but, but as support coordinators, talk to other support coordinators and what do they use? So I just use the, I just developed my own basic template. So it really just says, you know, what is your relationship to the participant? What level of support are you providing? Um, what are your observations? What are the outcomes that you're achieving? Um, you know, these are the person's goals. What actions have been you, you know, supported to? So, how have you supported the participant to work towards achieving their goals? And then, just really any other comments. So, are there has been any significant changes? Um, so, it's really again gathering that evidence so that you can keep it as part of your reporting to show that something has changed or something hasn't changed. But again, it's coming back to what are the outcomes that you're achieving? What are achievements have you seen? So, again. Thinking about the NDIS progress report template and thinking about the information that you provide, developing a bit of a really one pager template for support workers, especially if they're independent support coordinator workers, because sometimes when you've got a participant who has a range of independent support workers and they don't have a lead support worker, then they're all working individually. So how do you bring them together um, and get them to all provide the same consistent information? thinking about that re progress report template, and then having some dot points and getting them to answer it. I find that's the best way to do it. But again, checking in, especially if you've got independent support workers, that they have service agreements, and also writing into that service agreement that, hey, we would really like a report from you at least once a year, and this is what it's going to look like, and I can provide you with a template so that you can actually start to gather that information. So when I request it, it's going to be quite, you know, you'll know exactly what I'm asking for. Uh, the next one comes from Christine. It says, I actually work for a provider and when I at times try to get updated information from a support coordinator, I am faced with, I cannot help you as I have no more funding to work on the client with you. Okay. So I, yes. I think maybe she's looking for some advice on that. Okay, so from that I'm saying, Christine, you provide, you're working for a provider providing other services and you're talking about getting information from a support coordinator. Okay. Um, I, I find that really concerning. And Christine, I'm happy for you to contact me. Um, my email address is on there if you want to talk about this situation because it sounds quite complex. Um, but a support coordinator, a really good quality professional support coordinators will actually plan out the use of their hours across the life of the plan. And they are always tracking their support coordination hours. So if they find that there's been a change in situation or something's happening and they're starting to run out of hours, then they would be planning ahead to actually put a change of situation in to provide evidence around the need for more support coordination hours. So if someone's saying to you, I'm working with this participant, but I can't, I can't actually tell you anything or I can't do anything because I don't have any more funding, then I would be very concerned about that. But again, I don't know the situation. So happy to talk to you more if you want to contact me more about this. Hopefully Thanks. that's helpful. The next one comes from Francis. And Francis says, I was advised by the NDIS planner that the roster of care is no longer used by them for funding purpose, but just for providers' internal purposes. Besides the FCA, are there any reports we need to submit as evidence that influence sufficient funding for participants? Um, it would depend on each individual participant. So again, um, uh, I really need to understand the context. But really a functional capacity assessment is if you if you start working with a participant and they've never had a functional capacity assessment, which I'm assuming they would have, but if they haven't, that would be the first thing that I get because again, that helps you to set that baseline. Um, that also informs whether the functional capacity assessment and the NDIS plan align. Because if you start to get work with a participant and they're not aligning, if the functional capacity assessment is saying, this is the impact of their disability and these are the supports that they're going to need, and the NDIS plan is completely different or it has uh, doesn't have funding on there to support this person, then I would be going back for a review. So again, each situation will be really, really different. So again, happy for you to contact me if you want to talk about that a bit more. Hopefully that's helpful. <laughs> and the next Sorry, one comes so from Christine. Uh, we've got a few here. So this one's from Christine. Should a support coordinator provide any risks about a participant to a provider? Uh, it should be the other way around. 
So if you're a service provider and you're a sole provider, especially, or you're a support worker, or you could be uh, providing domestic support in the home, or you're a provider that has directly seen something or observed something when you are supporting that participant, then you're as professional responsibility, especially as part of the code of conduct, to put in a critical incident report. And you should be providing that critical incident report to the support coordinator. So often it's a support coordinators find out about changes in a person's situation or incidents or observations from that support network, which is why it's important for a support coordinator to build that collaborative working relationship with all of that person's support network so that when things do happen or they do see something that much more likely to pick up the phone or email a support coordinator and go, hey, just making you aware of that's happened. Then a support coordinator's role is to step in there and go, right, tell me about what happened, what was the impact. They would then go and review the person's supports and talk with that participant and then network directly around, you know, ha what happened, what was the impact, and do we need to look at, you know, reviewing your support needs. Yeah. The next one comes from Darren and Darren asks, why are we support coordinators required to complete the plan review report when the LACs are asking the same questions at their check-in meetings? Okay. So I suppose what why I've been saying is why support was required to complete the plan review report and the LCs should Okay. So I don't know. <laughs> I think there's a breakdown in communication between an LAC and a request for service. So a request for service is done right at the beginning. And sometimes I find with a request for service, it depends on the person who's filling that in. So they might just go generically, implementation report at eight weeks, NDIS review or progress report done at the end of the year or within the second year of the plan or whatever that might be. I suppose as a support coordinator, coming back to that review process, when you're starting to get within the last three months of a participant's plan, contact the planner or contact the LAC and go, hey, we're coming up to the review process. Can you just let me know what your intention is? If we had that much better transparency and accountability around that open communication between the NDIS and the planner, then these things wouldn't happen. But unfortunately, they do. So be proactive. You know that the plan review is coming up. Contact them before those 90 days and go, hey, we're coming up to this period. How about we work together to really understand what process you're going to implement? Because I'm going to go through this process and I'm starting to gather this information. So just letting you know that, you know, the participant and the network will be ready for a review meeting if that's what you're going for within this time frame. However, if, you know, and the, and the LAC might start to say, well, how are these supports? Are they, are they? quite stable, is everything going really, really well? Maybe we can just do that check-in process. So I suppose it's a really about being a bit more proactive and contacting the NDIA and say, hey, what are the plans? I found that that's, that works quite well. And again, that's building those relationships and networks with the LACs and planners, if you can get a hold of them. Thank you. And we have another question from Japinda Jit. Does the support coordinator need to do something with incident reports given by SIL provider or support worker? It's really about when you receive, look, if someone contacts you and say that this has happened, as a support coordinator, you'd be reminding them of their professional obligation around the code of conduct, but also around quality and safeguard commission conditions around putting in that incident report, getting a copy of it. Um, really helps you to evidence, especially if you're going for a review or a change of situation, um, really helps you to evidence the, uh, uh, they often indicate an, an, a requirement for an increase in the person's support needs. So that's really good evidence around that the support needs need to change. And then you would be really talking to the participant and their support network around, so what's the impact for the person? What does this actually mean? Do we need to review the supports? You would also, depending on the incident that actually happened, if there's quite high risk involved, you'd be talking to the provider around what strategies have they started to put in place? How are you managing the risk? And you'd really be starting to bring together that care review or the care, care meetings with the stakeholder group and talking about, let's talk about this incident. How are we going to manage this risk? And really starting to get into your risk assessments and risk management plans because if you need to go for a change of situation, that's the evidence that you're going to need. 
Hopefully that helps. Tracy's yeah. asked if you could please list the six domains. Hey, try and remember all of them. Um, if you actually go onto the NDIS website and you look at the access criteria, they talk about the six domains of reduced significant reduced functional capacity. So they talk about communication, trying to remember all of them, communication, um, mobility, uh, self-care, self-management, learning. What's the last one? Can anyone remind me what the last one is? Just trying to go through them. I can't remember. But if you go into the NDIS website and you look at the access criteria, especially the operational guidelines, then they will clearly detail and explain what the six domains are. Hopefully that helps. The My ability question... motor skills community, here we go. So someone has actually put them up oh, here. Right. Fantastic. I might just copy those over to the other questions so that social interaction as well. There. Well done, Caitlin. So social interaction, which is yeah, you know, um, is is the other one that I missed. Okay. Awesome. Um, when there is a gap in funding, what would be the best information we should provide to the NDIS for the gap to be funded so the service providers can be paid, especially for SIL participants? Uh, I'd need to under understand the context of the situation. Um, Nicola, do you want to have a go at that one? To me, that's probably linking more into a change of situation if you're talking okay. about a, a gap of funding. Although I guess if a plan review is coming up, you can can use that process. So if I've understood it right, it's going to be around establishing that it's reasonable and necessary supports. Um, quite a, a detailed response to walk you all through that. So probably what I would say is, we are planning another one of these webinars where that's exactly what we'll unpack in more detail. Um, so I'd encourage you to to register for that session. Hopefully I've understood your question right there too. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And we did have a question in the chat section from Andanthi um, asking, is there a time frame of valid for the functional report? meaning it has to be done within six months, et cetera. Now, Darren has responded to this and he has said the FCA is valid for two years. So I try and line up the FCA with the ending of their plan. If you could add more to that, Mary. Yeah. Um, and, and again, I talked about a functional capacity assessment before. So again, if someone doesn't have one, it would be the first report that you would be sourcing um, from an occupational therapist, because that will really help you to understand the functional impact, but also really indicates the support needs that need to align with their NDIS plan. Um, in relation to, again, I get a lot of mixed information around functional capacity assessments, but from my experience, um, I've worked with people who have um, the, the functional impact of their disability doesn't really change. Um, and so that functional capacity assessment is quite consistent. And what I do is I ask for that OT to do an update to that report. So, so the functional impact is still the same. These are the new goals. These are the new supports that are going to be. So they're actually, here's the progress, here's the outcomes we've achieved, and these are the next things that we're working on. I always get an OT to really go back and do that assessments around um, the impact on being able to complete daily activities. Um, so I refer back to the original functional capacity assessment, and then I provide them with that update. So I've found that that works really, really well. Doesn't look like we have any more questions, um, but that's probably great for timing at the moment. So we'll go on to the lucky door prize and we'll announce the winner of that. So the winner for today's lucky door prize, which is a coaching session with Support Coordination Academy, is Sarah Jordan from GCLA. So congratulations, Sarah. Uh, Mary, did you want to give a brief explanation of what that Support Coordination coaching session will be? Sure. Um, so we do professional coaching with a lot of support coordinators, specialist support coordinators, support coordinator teams. Um, we do them either flexibly, so one off or scheduled when people need them, or else we do them on a monthly basis. And that's more of a uh, more around like supervision and ongoing professional development based on the team's learning needs. 
Um, so the coaching session, will re it's really, really flexible. So it really talks about so what are some of the challenges that you're finding at the moment? What are some of the areas that you'd like, you know, more skill development in? So we target the coaching session based on your own individual learning needs and your own, where you're at in relation to your professional development. So it could range from understanding how to write a really good evidence-based report to get great outcomes for your participants, right through to someone who wants to set up an independent business or uh, how to put processes and systems in place. Um, it, it will really depend on the person or the organisation that they're working with. So again, right. um, Caitlin will send out that voucher and she'll link in um, Support Coordination Academy and then we will contact you directly to organise that session. Congrats, Sarah. Uh, if you didn't win today and you'd like the opportunity to go into our next Lucky Door Prize, we will actually have another one running at our next learning session, which is coming up in February. So the details are on the screen now. It is on Wednesday, the 21st of February. After the session, I'll be sending out a survey and I'm actually going to include the registration link along with that survey so that you can register for that next session. We'd love to see you there. Thanks for joining us today and thanks, Mary. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Learning and Lifestyle Hub. This is where we make learning fun. Hi. I'm Grace. I live independently with support when I need it. I live my life my way. Hi, my name's Jeremy. And my daughter's three years old. My daughter's proud that I come to work. Hi, I'm Maddie and I work for the Endeavour Foundation. I come to work with a big smile on my face every day. Love to work here because that's, that's my new family. 